country. For our country. Its members are everywhere. We'll pray for you tonight. Thank okay? you. For my race. For my race. It could be right next door. For my clan. For my clan. KKK. For most people, three simple letters evoke a dark and sinister past. A history of intimidation, terror, and murder. Yet few outsiders know anything about this secret society today. The invisible empire of the Ku Klux Klan has remained a closed universe until now. My name is Frank Ancona. I'm the Imperial Wizard of the traditionalist American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. I have been a Klansman for 21 years. Ancona is the national leader for one of the largest Klan organizations in the country. The Imperial Wizards is like the CEO of the Klan. He sets the policy for the organization. He sets the direction for the Klan. Now, for the first time ever, Frank Ancona is inviting a film crew to document a summer with his Klan, which has a policy of strict secrecy. The secrecy, that's part of the strength of the Klan, is people do not know how many members we have, who they are, and where they are. For Klansmen, Ku Klux Klan means a circle of brothers, known as the Invisible Empire, ever since its creation in the years following the Civil War. The traditionalist American Knights are just one of reportedly 30 different Klan groups operating around the United States today. I want to introduce you to the Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Another Klan group is the Knights Party, under the leadership of Pastor Thomas Robb who has allowed exclusive access to film the annual National Leadership Congress held in the Ozark Mountains of northern Arkansas. Much more secretive is a group known as the Order of the Ku Klux Klan, one of whose leaders is stepping out of the shadows for the first time on television. I'm the Grand Dragon for the realm of South Dakota, Order of the Ku Klux Klan. Yet there is one man who may know more than anyone else alive about the KKK an unofficial advisor and inspiration to clans around the United States, the keeper of all the secrets. Nearly all the Ku Klux Klans out there today got most, if not all, of what they know about clan craft, clan tradition, ritual, ceremony, and history from me. <laughs> I've been doing this for 30 years. His name is Richard Bondira, and he is known to his fellow clansmen as the Great Blue Fustin. The title means historian. So here I am in the middle of nowhere, which I like to call the last place on earth, and I'm a leading authority on the Ku Klux Klan. Well, I get a kick out of that. I like to be able to go about anywhere and do anything without anybody really knowing who I am. That invisibility also helps him with security concerns. True clan members praise me. The imitation ones, the fakes, the phonies, the Nazis, the skinheads, and so on want, want me dead. <laughs> Illegal clan guys are the ones who break the law, who try to use terrorism or threats, intimidation. And they don't like the idea that I let the people know about them. His four walls are a cramped, surreal archive, a living record of the life of the clan behind the scenes and beneath the hood. Weddings and picnics, birthdays and gravestones, ceremonies and rituals. Now, what's the job of a clan historian? Obviously, gathering up all this lost history. They're not going to find it anyplace else. Are you white people that are proud to be white? Yo! Yeah. He himself has never appeared on television before, and never until now displayed the full range of his collection, his connections, and his knowledge. All this contains rare almost impossible to find information. This is a restrike of original clan coins. Bondera teaches today's clan members that mainstream history of the KKK is nothing but a lie. What you're getting in the mass media is distortionism, deliberate omissions, uh, uh, fictionalization of clan history. They take the misdeeds of 1% and blow it up to look like the organization was founded to do those misdeeds. The reality is, is there has never been a moment in the history of the Ku Klux Klan in America when it was not closely associated with violence. Mark Potok is a senior fellow at the Southern Poverty Law Center, which was firebombed by the Ku Klux Klan. In 1983, 
three Klansmen literally came up out of the sewers, lifted off a manhole cover, broke into our offices, uh, and firebombed them. If the Klan has a determined enemy, it is the Southern Poverty Law Center, which successfully sued one Klan out of existence and monitors all the rest to this day. There was a threat to uh, literally flay the founder of the uh, Southern Poverty Law Center to tear his skin off. So, you know, we are very much an enemy out there. You know, we have an enormous amount of security, uh, and, and it's something that we really have to do. The Southern Poverty Law Center has listed 30 different Ku Klux Klan organizations as hate groups. Listing the Ku Klux Klan as a hate group is uh, probably the easiest decision we've ever made. The gun, the noose, the knife, the burning cross, through its entire history, uh, it has been, in effect, a terrorist organization. The 150-year history of one of America's most terrifying organizations began as a sophomoric gag. The Ku Klux Klan began innocently enough uh, Christmas Eve, 1865, in a law office in Pulaski, Tennessee, when six ex-Confederate officers were sitting around deciding what to do with their time. They decided that they would form an organization based on the college fraternities, and they would get into all kinds of prankstering and hazings and things like that. In the beginning, that ferocious name was playful. The name itself, Ku Klux, is based on the Greek word kuklos, which means wheel or band. So they wanted to create mystery. They wanted to have fun. Almost immediately, that early clan uh, turned into a violent and terroristic organization. Under pressure from the federal government, that original clan disbanded in 1869, but its legacy has lived on ever since. Now, a long, hot summer with the Ku Klux Klan begins. To get inside the Invisible Empire, the film crew turned to photojournalist Anthony Karen, who has spent years documenting the hidden world of the KKK. The journey begins on a Sunday morning in early June. The place, Ironton, Missouri. We have this petition for people to sign if they want to help get the Confederate battle flag restored at the uh, Civil War historic sites in Missouri. Part of our history, it's really important. Exactly. Thank you, gave us love. You guys should come down here more often. God bless you. God bless you. We don't want you racist in this town. We got black grandbabies. How about that? I, I just can't believe in America that we're still doing this. I mean, really? Because all they do is discriminate against black. No, man. 99% of what you've been taught about us is totally wrong. I want to know why the Ku Klux Klan are allowed in our town. Man, I'm the Imperial Wizard. And uh, we didn't come out here to tell nobody they couldn't live here. Well, our town believes that the Ku Klux Klan is racist. Really? Your whole town believes The whole it? town, Everybody. yes. Well, see, I don't... I'm glad you educated me. Thanks. Well, I'm just, you know, I just don't understand why the Ku Klux Klan comes to our town. I know what they represent. <laughs> and that, that's, that's laughable. Michael Stagner is in Kona's deputy in the traditionalist American Knights. He is known as the Imperial Claylift. People have a notion about the Klan that all we do is sit around on a Saturday night with our regalia on, drinking beer, talking about going out on a lynching party. That's not what the Klan's about. The Klan is not about violence. We don't hurt people. If we were what the people thought we were, there would be somebody hanging from a tree on every corner. The reality is the Klan is all about hate. You know, it's like they live in opposite world. You know, the idea somehow that the Klan is this great organization, many Klansmen are victims of their own propaganda. They very probably actually believe this idea uh, that hundreds of historians are lying. A burning question arises. With the first African-American president and a rapidly growing non-Caucasian population, is a new era coming. Will the violence of the Ku Klux Klan return, or will this time be different? The Ku Klux Klan is not this horrible organization that it's been portrayed to be. I haven't seen anyone out here 
hating anybody. They don't want to hear the truth. So that, you know, some people just run from the truth. We are here to bring hope to America and to bring hope to the white race. We're in trouble. We're in big trouble. People need to wake up. Wake up. The intention of this country was to be a white Christian country. Period. We are not a hate group, they say on their websites. They don't want to do anything violent, but they want to reimpose white supremacy. Well, you know, how exactly is that going to happen? I guess Frank Ancona and his followers really haven't thought that one through. With a history of violence, how can the Klan convince the world that its members have truly given up their bloody past? Welcome to the KKK charity event. Members of the Ku Klux Klan allow a film crew to spend the summer inside the Invisible Empire. Here, at a charity event in Ledwood, Missouri, hosted by the traditionalist American Knights. You got this for anybody that comes up that might need something delivered to them later or something? Or anybody help needs... for Christmas? Yeah, Christmas dinner, Christmas toys. Good to me, buddy. Glad you came out. Yeah. We got some people that need some food here, lobbies. <laughs> Sandwich. Sure. <laughs> Water. At the charity event today, we are feeding the less fortunate in our area, handing out articles that people need in their household, such as uh, toothbrushes, toothpaste, soap, school supplies for their children, and making sack lunch for people that come out today. In my lifetime, I haven't seen economic times as hard as they are right now. See you later, man. There's a lot of people that are a lot worse off than we are and we'd like to help. The idea that these groups can redeem the Klan, I think, is a complete joke. So we are talking about the lynchings of enormous numbers of people. We're talking about castrations, rapes. From the very beginning right up to the present moment, the instrument of the Ku Klux Klan has been terrorism. Members of a separate and even more secretive KKK group, the Order of the Ku Klux Klan, have come to help out, including the Grand Dragon of South Dakota, who agreed to speak out on condition of anonymity. The True Klan is not a hate organization. It's actually more of a love organization. Personally, in South Dakota, we have helped blacks with food baskets. We've helped Native Americans. There's a lot of people who don't realize that the Klan is in South Dakota until they get a food basket. We will help anybody in need, no matter what race they are. He says the Klan has made him a better person. By becoming a Klansman, I've become a better Christian, I've become a better American, and I feel that becoming a Klansman actually brought me closer to God. Until now, the Order of the Ku Klux Klan and the traditionalist American Knights have been two separate groups in the hidden network of the Invisible Empire. There is no such thing as the one Ku Klux Klan. Today, the modern clan today must be classified as modern clans. You have several dozen independent organizations out there that use the name Ku Klux Klan as part of their overall name. Bondera calls both the traditionalist American Knights and the Order of the Ku Klux Klan legitimate clans. A legitimate clan does not break the law. They take an oath to uphold the law, uphold the Constitution, and if uh, you violate that, you're automatically banished as a clansman. With their shared agenda, the Order of the Ku Klux Klan and the traditionalist American Knights are considering a merger. The legitimate clans, some are merging in with Frank Ancona. He's got about the largest clan in the country right now because of these mergers. I think the heart of the clan experience for me is uh, the brotherhood, the family. No matter where you go in the United States, uh, wherever there's clansmen, you have family. Glad to meet you guys. You got any kids that need school supplies? Oh, if you know anybody hungry or needs any help with anything, tell them to come up here. I see the way things are going. I'm here to support you guys no matter what, you know. To this day, Americans continue to join the organizations that go by the name KKK. The reason that people still join the Klan today more than any other uh, is the real mystique that it still has, this idea that it's the invisible empire. This is a hidden force that protects the white race from all that ails it. A heavy police presence shadows the Klan charity event. 
Everything going good so far? Things are going good. I think some people are intimidated because you guys are here. But one guy I was talking to earlier, he said, well, I seen all the cops out there, and I thought there might have been some trouble, so I was kind of a little afraid to stop. They shouldn't be, you know? You know if you're a, a law-abiding citizen, what, 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 exactly, what are you worried about? You know? We have a good reputation with law enforcement. What are you guys' looks on, like, the whole outlook on you guys being racist and all the racism and comments and stuff? You're not supposed to hate nobody because of what race they are or what color their skin is. God created each species after its kind, and he saw it was good, you know? And, and you got different types of birds, like crows, sparrows. They stay with their own kind, but they're all birds, you know? So that's, that's kind of our view on it. By doing these events, we're hoping that people will see that we're not people who are out to hurt anybody. We're looking to help our community, our fellow man, and to do what Christ taught us to do. But is it possible to clean up that image in a country where millions of Americans still have a living memory of Klan violence and intimidation? Stanley Nelson is the editor-in-chief of the Concordia Sentinel in Faraday, Louisiana. A reporter on a mission to expose Klan crimes from the era of his youth, the 1960s. I do remember my parents going to the mailbox one day. And they came back with a uh, Klan um, smut sheet warning slash urging uh, white parents not to send their children to school with black people. That's probably my first memory of knowing something about the Klan. There were probably nine or 10 murders in this area that were definitely committed by the Klan. And only 20 or 30 percent have been solved. There were many, many more murders than what we will ever know about that occurred in those days. Nelson says the main culprits were a gang of Klansmen who called themselves the Silver Dollar Group. Well, the Silver Dollar Group was actually considered by the FBI a Klan inside a Klan. The goal of the Silver Dollar Group was to use whatever force or violence necessary to stop integration, to stop the civil rights movement. Many Klan-related murders from that era are still under investigation today by the Justice Department. Case in point, Joseph Edwards. So the last place Joseph Edwards was seen on this earth was right here along this levee. In June 1964, Edwards worked at a place called the Shamrock Hotel in Natchez, Mississippi, then a hotbed of Klan activity. So one night in June of 1964, he stopped in Fairview, Louisiana, and he had a beer. He told the bartender that he was heading to the Shamrock, and the reason was he was going to meet a white woman for a date around 11 o'clock that night. Eyewitness accounts say local law enforcement pulled Edwards over on this stretch of road, and he ran for it. Joseph Edwards' body has never been found. Um, his family has absolutely no idea where he is. Edwards is one of many believed to have been killed by the Klan. In almost every state, the Klan was operating, and we had an enormous number of bombings, uh, of murders carried out by the Klan. The September 1963 bombing of the 16th Street Baptist Church in Birmingham, Alabama. The famous killing of four little girls who were in white dresses getting ready for Sunday school that morning. Joseph Edwards has a sister. Her name is Julia, and she lives in the New Orleans area. She said that for years, the phone would ring, and her mother would answer and say, have you heard anything about Joe? Where's Joe? Do you know where Joe is? Even if there are no suspects alive, we just want to know what happened. That bloodshed is remembered in Missouri. So you guys view yourself more of a Christian organization than you do uh, a hate organization. Right, yeah, I don't consider us to be a hate group. When it comes to the reputation of the Klan, the Imperial Wizard of the Traditionalist American Knights has a sense of mission. I'm hoping that we can dispel that, that they don't associate us with Nazis, skinheads. I guess I better get back over here and... Okay, Frank, well, thanks for your time. I believe that we're seeing a rebirth of the Klan. I hope that I can lead it in the direction that God would want me to. At the Knights Party headquarters in the Ozark Mountains of northern Arkansas, an entire clan family is on a mission to win over hearts and minds. 
when the baby boomers dies off over the next 15 to 20 years, the majority of the voters in this country will be non-white, and America will enter the Dark Ages. Coming up next, a summer with the Klan goes even deeper, out of the woods and into the home of the most powerful family in the KKK. In an exclusive summer with the KKK, our cameras get off the streets and into the home. And Andrew's gonna open the packages for you, okay? And then you can dump them in, all right? And I'll get another bowl, all right? At first glance, it's an average American home. This is Rachel Pendergraft. She's the national organizer for the Knights Party. The Knights of the Ku Klux Klan is truly the last hope for America. Should we use all of them? You like the chocolate kind? That's a whole bunch. All right. Today, with her son Andrew and her nephew Tayton, she's baking cookies for an annual event, the National Leadership Congress of the Knights Party. In here. Yeah, we're going to put it in there, OK? The big lumpy part, she can chop on it and kind of break it up, OK? Oh, oh do this. It's starting to look like cookie dough, isn't it? Well, I collect snow globes. I got about 12 of them, which is cool, and uh, trying to get more of them. In this house, race is the tie that binds. Well, I, I think one of the, the most important aspects of raising children to have a white racial consciousness is to earn your children's respect but also to practice what you preach. So it's got to be based on love. It has to be built on the fact that you have genuine love and concern for your people. And children can tell fakes from the real thing. During her own childhood, the Invisible Empire was always an open secret. My friends in school, they did know that I was in the Klan. They did know that I was going to Klan rallies and going and distributing literature on a street corner somewhere. They also knew who her father was. This man, Thomas Robb, the national director of the Knights Party and a veteran of four decades in the movement. We must sound forth the message to our people. Remember who you are. You can be white, you can be proud, you can love who you are. It doesn't make you a bad person. You can be white and proud and be a good father. You can be white and proud and be a good mother. I don't see how you can take that organization with its history and make it into anything positive or good for the community. But for the Rob family, clan and community are one and the same, and everyone does their part. These are Rachel Pendergraft's daughters, Shelby and Charity, and their folk band, Heritage Connection, specializing in white power lyrics. I can see you walking down your life's long dark road, searching for a people you have never known. We started with violin lessons, and then we did that. She was seven and I was 10, and then we did a lot of singing in church. Loved we, our people and thought that we could use the talent that God gave us to help spread a message to him. Your race is dying. The youngest member of the family also has a role to play. I'm Andrew, and this is The Andrew Show. At the age of 12, he's a seasoned broadcaster online. Mr. Mosby, who is black, and Miss Tutwiler, who is white, got engaged. Now that is just wrong and sick. Now don't let anyone tell you that guns are bad because cops have guns and they are good. Tune in next week. Bye. Andrew's mother serves as both coach and inspiration. And then did you have any particular topics or have they started any new shows up on, on uh, Cartoon Network? The Young Justice Show. On one scene, I saw a non-white kiss a white guy. 
Yeah. Okay. So there's some interracial, yeah. like, dating scenes or something? Kind of. Already, Andrew has made a name for himself. At the Knights Party National Headquarters, father and daughter do a regular broadcast of their own called This is the Clan, which bills itself as the world's first and only white pride internet TV show. And in the commercial, the bully was a white boy, and the kid getting picked on and bullied was a black boy. Anyone with half a brain knows the reality of who is being bullied in the schools. This episode's big topic, the 2012 presidential race. We invited Romney and invited Obama uh, to attend our National Leadership Conference right. and address the issues of white people. Each of them went to and spoke before La Raza, mm -hmm. which is a, a Hispanic group. They spoke before the NAACP mm -hmm. convention. They had no well, problem going so to those making, groups. They're making the rounds. Well, not, not completely. <laughs> There's a couple stops that they're not making. Ku Klux Klan members pay for the cost of this broadcast and everything else owned by the Knights Party. We operate a donation. We have membership dues, and we have people who make contributions. We are not funded by Wall Street. Ford Motor Company does not support us. Even NASCAR doesn't support us. They're trying to go right. after the, uh, the black uh, viewer now. Rob's button-down version of the KKK is the legacy of the most famous modern Klansman, David Duke. Thomas Robb was once an underling of David Duke. And Duke, of course, is the person who initially introduced the idea of, uh, you know, we need to get out of the corn pastures and into the hotel meeting rooms. We need to get out of the robes and into the three-piece suits. So Robb is very much a follower of that idea. We are an organization that is concerned about national issues. We're concerned about issues facing our people. I think the ideal population, the ideal target of the people that we want to reach are the middle class people. Okay, we'll wait 15 minutes and we'll take those out, okay? The soccer moms, the teachers, just that whole segment of society. Coming up next, a clan message that most outsiders will never hear, spoken to true believers behind closed doors. The Ku Klux Klan is all about family. It's about America, it's about mom, it's about apple pie, and there are white families who are bound and determined until their dying breath to save this nation, and that deserves the hand of God on our shoulder as he sees us through to the end. God bless America! Jesus Christ was a white man. And then it's okay to be white and proud, no matter what people say. The two people dating are race mixing, and that is not good. Deep inside the closed world of the night's party, a film crew is about to witness what most outsiders never see, a gathering of true believers at an event called the National Leadership Congress. Our Father, we thank you for your grace. Be with those people throughout this nation who are holding forth the bloodstained banner of Jesus Christ. Amen. The National Leadership Congress is a sort of KKK tent revival and political rally all in one. The Ku Klux Klan is alive and well because it is God's own design that the organization that saved our people once will save it once again. Younger people who don't have a time reference before 1970, they don't understand what I'm saying because they, they cannot identify with the, with, with the old America. They've been raised in this, this multicultural nation, and they think this new normal is normal. But this new normal is not normal. It's not normal to America. It's not normal to our heritage. Not normal to our history. For Klansmen, that history is based in Christianity and is divinely white. Race mixing is not a creation, it is a destruction. Each race is an expression of God's overall creation. He commanded like to reproduce after like. Today, people think there's this natural attraction between the races. It's a brainwashed attraction. There is not a natural attraction. This country was based upon a white identity. 
they still talk about inferior races. They still talk about the mongrels. The whole idea that they are a nonviolent group merely being proud of white people, I think, is ludicrous on its face. Their goal necessitates political violence on a massive scale. But if they mean to have a war, let it begin here. God gave you a covenant of conquest. He said, every place that your sole of your foot shall stand and tread upon, that land have I given you. There has never been a time where we submitted. It is they, the enemy, the heathen, they have always submitted. They have a history of submission. You have a history of conquest. That is why your enemies don't want you to be proud of your history. Because a history of our people is a history of conquest. It's a rallying cry for an undeclared war of the 21st century. The moment, the very, very, very split second, you become proud, you become a conqueror again. Tom Robb says he's leading the hope of white Christian revival. Now, what is that? He only has about two or three basic speeches. They're all broad generalizations. He never gives any kind of a plan. What are our goals? Where do we intend to be two years from now, five years from now? Bondera believes, unlike Thomas Robb, Frank Ancona does have a plan, and it's modeled on the Klan's own history. I would like to see the Klan come back to the former glory it once had back in the uh, 1920s. After the original Klan disbanded in 1869, it was decades before a new version emerged. That happened in 1915, the so-called second era of the Klan. The second era Klan was able to spread completely out of the South. It wasn't even particularly heavier in the South than it was in the North, uh, and reached an enormous size. It's a period most Americans don't even know existed, a time when the Ku Klux Klan really was mainstream. There was an entire Klan popular culture, movies produced by the KKK, and music. I've been like the preserver of the great lost mystery. I'll just read off some of the titles here. The Klansmen and the Rain. We belong to the Ku Klux Klan, the Gathering Klan, like the Gathering Storm. You could buy them in stores everywhere, record stores, department stores. They had a very positive slant. The song, Why I'm a Klansman, says it takes a man, American, to love his liberty. That's why I'm a Klansman, and where a Klansman's man, and raise my hand for heaven. The Klan, by 1925, reached a membership of something around 4 million people. A very large number of white Americans today have ancestors who are members of the Ku Klux Klan. Possibly including some of the most powerful men in the country. Take Harry Truman, for example, who was a member of the Klan from 1920 to 1922. Now, his family has been denying his membership in the Klan ever since, and probably always will, but the fact was he was an ordinary Klansman. Harry Truman may have been a member of the Klan, but uh, that's not clear. But Warren G. Harding, in fact, was sworn in as a Klansman in the White House. At the time, uh, this was a country that was very much dominated by Protestant whites. We began to see very large waves of Catholic immigration, and that is really what the Klan of the 1920s was about. That clan did not like black people, it didn't like brown people, but the real enemy was, in fact, Catholics. In this era, the Ku Klux Klan first used the symbol that would terrify the world. Going all the way back to the 1920s, the Burning Cross has been best known as an instrument of terrorism. The lighted cross placed on the lawn of the home of the interracial couple, that's the reality. The idea of the fiery cross in the original Ku Klux Klan was based on a novel called The Klansmen. The Klansmen were portrayed as knights 
a band of noble patriots who were standing up against the ravages of Reconstruction. The novel inspired a movie, Birth of a Nation. It was screened in the White House for President Woodrow Wilson, who was so taken with it that he said, it's like writing history with lightning. The Fiery Cross is a tradition that continues to this day. In the woods of Southern Missouri, in preparation for their own cross-lighting ritual, the traditionalist American Knights hold a top secret state meeting, known as a clarero. For the first time ever, clan members allow a film crew to attend. To all citizens of the Invisible Empire, in the name of our valiant and venerated dead, I affectionately greet you. Then as now, the government was in the hands of villains determined to destroy the way of life of the people who created this nation. Then as now, the Constitution became a dead document scorned by the traitors who ruled. Klansmen, do we believe in our cause? Yes. Let us work and pray for the day that the Ku Klux Klan will once again save America. Coming up next, the final stop in a summer inside the KKK to witness the most sacred ritual of the order. As the sun begins to fade, members of the traditionalist American Knights are preparing to light what they believe is a holy fire. As the sun drops, the most sacred ritual of the traditionalist American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan is about to begin. The cross and the torches are marinated in a concoction called Klan Cologne. All we need is burlap and wire, huh? What's the weather, man? My name is Clark. I'm the Imperial Nighthawk. I'm the keeper of the fiery cross. My role in a cross lighting is to make sure that it turns out right and everybody's safe and goes home with a good feeling. Position of prayer, everyone. Our kind, gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you. We ask that you bless each and one of our efforts here. And we ask this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 A summer inside, the invisible empire of the Ku Klux Klan comes to an end with the most sacred ritual of the order. And hope among these men for a revival, for even the slightest spark of that long ago golden age. This is a good time for the clan. There is a rebirth. It's grown quite a large amount. There's more unity amongst the clan. Yet their numbers today appear to be small. You probably have about 4,000. And it's hard to number them because it's broken up amongst a couple dozen independent organizations, the leaders of which distort their own figures. The clan today, they are a very, very pale shadow of their former selves. Their history is a terrible, terrible history, and yet they're trying to sell themselves uh, as the way forward. Whatever the future of the Ku Klux Klan in America, on this night in southern Missouri, two pieces of hardwood will have the final say. For some people, that extra family closeness that they get to see the cross of Jesus Christ lit up in holy flame, it sends a chill down their back, and it kind of makes everything make sense. The cross we light as a representation that Christ is the light of the world. As light dispels darkness, may the light of Christ dispel the sin in your life. God is the author of liberty. God chose the white race to show God's love and light in this world. It's a spiritual experience, you know. You feel the presence of God, you know, you, you understand the sacrifice that he made for you. And we also realize that, you know, it's our duty to be his light here on earth, to shine the light of Christ. All right, let's have everybody line up here. Imperial Nighthawk, keeper of the fiery flame. You accept the light? Yes, I did. Accept the light? Yes, I do. Accept the light? Yes, I do. Set the light? Yes. Set the light? Yes, I do.
Klansmen. Forward march. Remember, stay six feet apart. Klansmen, halt. Right face. For my God. For my God. For my country. For my country. For my race. For my race. For the traditionalist American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. For the traditionalist American Knights of the Ku Klux Klan. Klansmen, left face. Forward march. Klansmen, halt. Right face. For my God. For my God. For my God. For my country. For my country. For my family. For my family. For my clan. For my clan. Klansmen, right the cross. Klansmen, salute the fiery cross. Behold the fiery cross, still brilliant. All the troubled history failed to quench its hallowed flame. It shall burn bright as morning for all decades to be. We are not the evil people that is portrayed in Hollywood. We don't hurt people. We believe in this country, and we are proud of our race. It shall burn bright as morning for all decades to be. The idea that the Klan can be brought back as it once was, a huge, powerful organization with millions of members, I think is absolutely ludicrous. We do not burn but light the cross to signify that Christ is the light of the world and that his light destroys darkness. You could have a duel with them on the Bible because there's plenty of passages in the Bible that address how we're supposed to live our lives. And one that comes to my mind is Proverbs 28, 17, which says, A man that is laden with the guilt of human blood shall be a fugitive until death. Let no one support him. And the Klan has uh, lots of blood on its hand. God give us men who will not flinch at duty and who will not lie. We have a heritage and culture that they want to preserve. They want America to look like America. They don't want it to look like Mexico. They don't want it to look like Saudi Arabia. They don't want it to look like Indonesia. They don't want to reflect the ideals and values that built this country. America, the beautiful.